What a privilege and joy it is for me to be able to share in this great series, Your Best Life Yet. I'm grateful to the Lord that I can share and be able to share the culminating message in this series with my message being entitled, Your Best Assignment. Before we talk with you, let's talk with God. Our Father in heaven, Lord, this day we thank you and we praise you that we can speak a word on behalf of you. So speak to your people. Uh, go now, God, to all those who view and all those who hear and speak a word to them, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. In life, we all have assignments. On the job, we have work or job assignments. In the classroom, there are classroom assignments. Having been married 24 years, I have home assignments because my wife always has a honey-do list for me. But regardless of our work assignments or our classroom assignments or our home assignments, we have a best assignment. What is that best assignment? Well, that best assignment is rooted in John chapter 3, verse number 16. We all know this text, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And it's out of this text where we get our best assignment. John 3.16 is arguably the most popular text in the Bible. If it's not the greatest, it is probably the most well-known and best-loved verse in the Bible. There are only 25 words in this text, but no other single text in the Bible has blessed so many people. Martin Luther called it, if you will, the miniature gospel. Others have said it's the gospel in a nutshell. Others have called it a love letter from God written in blood and addressed to all. And while it is, it is a beloved verse among millions everywhere. If there were ever a verse that Satan wanted to get out of the Bible, it's John 3.16. Because if there were ever a verse that made hell shudder, it's John 3.16. If there were ever a verse that made demons tremble, it's John 3.16. But if there were ever a verse that lightened the path to heaven, it's John 3.16. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This verse has been preached in so many different ways. Some people have divided the verse into parts like, number one, God's grace, for God so loved the world. Number two, God's gift that he gave his only begotten son. Number three, God's gospel, that whosoever believe in him. And then number four, God's glory shall have everlasting life. Some have preached it by saying the greatest love, God so loved the world. Others have said the greatest gift that he gave his only son. The greatest faith that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. The greatest life, but have everlasting life. Some have preached John 3, 16 by simply saying, it shows the greatest, for God, the greatest one, so loved the greatest degree, the world, the greatest amount of people, that he gave the greatest generosity, his only begotten son, the greatest uniqueness, that whosoever, the greatest invitation, believeth in him, the greatest simplicity, should not the greatest certainty perish the greatest possible loss, but the greatest difference, have the greatest possession, eternal, the greatest length, life, the greatest gift. For God so loved the world. But what, my friends, if God had not loved the world? If God had not loved the world, there would be no hope in the world. There would be nothing to live for and no purpose for our existence. It would be a world where our prayers were but nothing but useless cries 
to the skies. Every death would be the end of personal hope and every grave a place of despair. But today, I'm so glad that God so loved the world. I'm so glad today that Jesus loved me. I'm so glad that death is not a period, but only a comma in the story of life. But what then if God had not sent his son? What instead, if instead of God giving us his son, he gave us what we deserve? What if he had given us death? What if instead of sending his son to die for you and for me and giving us opportunity to have eternal life forever, what if he had just destined us all to hell? What if God's offer of salvation was not for whosoever? What if God's offer of salvation had just been for the rich? What if God's offer of salvation had just been for the educated? What if God's offer of salvation had just been for the healthy and the fit? What if salvation was only offered to good, righteous, and pious people? If God had done that, then none of us would have ever had any hope. None of us would have ever had any hope of seeing Jesus because the Bible says that before God, there is none good. No, not one. But I'm so glad today. Romans chapter 5, verse number 8 says that God commendeth his love toward us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Which means, friends of mine, God did not save us after we got rid of our sins, but God saves us in our sins. God doesn't save us once we clean up and we're good enough for him, God doesn't save us after we have made ourselves righteous or holy. But rather, it's just the opposite. God saves us in our sin, just as we are, and then he saves us from our sin and makes us what we ought to be. So I may not be all that I should be, but praise God, I'm not what I used to be, because I'm so glad that God's love is for whosoever. God loves Christians, but he also loves Jews, Buddhists, and Hindus. God loves believers, but he also loves atheists and agnostics. God loves Americans, but he also loves Asians, Africans, and Australians. God loves black people, but he also loves white people red people, and yellow people. God loves the city folk, but he also loves country folk. God loves the civilized, but God also loves the heathen. God loves preachers, but he also loves prostitutes. God loves doctors and lawyers and teachers, but he also loves cheaters, drug dealers, and murderers. God loves all. God didn't just love a world full of saints, but God loves a world full of sinners too. But don't get it twisted. He loves the sinner, uh, but he doesn't love the sin. He loves the criminal, not the crime. He loves the rebel, but not the rebellion. He loves the liar and not the lie. He loves the idolater, but not the idol. God loves all. A sinner may go to hell unsaved, but a sinner cannot go to hell unloved. God loves all, all colors, all individuals, all social groups. God loves all. And because God loves all, God died for all. And because God's love is for whosoever, God's salvation is for whosoever. That means anybody that's young, that's old, that's average, that's smart, that's black, that's white, that's educated, that's uneducated, that's upper class, that's lower class, that's adventurer, and that's adulterer, that's deacon, and that's dope dealer. 
That's church singer and that's blues singer. That's wicked sinners and that's also wannabe saints. God's salvation is for whosoever. So don't ever act like you've got the big head. Don't do that. That you're better than somebody else. Because friends of mine, pointing your finger at someone else, remember there are three fingers pointing back at you. Talking about someone else, but yet you've got skeletons in your own closet. No one lives in a glass house. Don't judge somebody else just because they got caught and you didn't. But not only that, don't judge someone else differently just because they sin differently than you do. Sin is sin. All of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners saved by grace. God died for us all. God loves us all. For God so loved the world, which means God loves all. If you were the only person on earth, my friends, God would have sent Jesus just to die for you. That's how much he loves you. God sent his son Jesus to die for your sins, to die for my sins, to die for all of our sins. And his blood he shed on the cross is the only thing that can save us from our sins. Not the preacher, not the teacher, not the church, not your ushering, not your returning tithe, not your singing in the choir or the praise team, not cooking meals for potluck, not your amens, not your hallelujahs. Only Jesus can save you. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus was our substitute who paid the penalty for our sins that we deserve to pay. And what I love about Jesus is Jesus gives us everlasting life free of charges. He gives us the opportunity for life with him. All we have to do, my friends, is ask, believe, and receive. Let me tell you a little story. Back in 1830, there was a man by the name of George Wilson. George Wilson was convicted of robbing the United States mail and was sentenced to be hanged. Now, that was a big deal back then in the 1830s, and the president of the United States at the time, President Andrew Jackson, issued a pardon for Wilson. But yet, Wilson refused to accept it. And so the matter had to go to Chief Justice Marshall, who concluded that Wilson would have to be executed. A pardon is a slip of paper, wrote Chief Justice Marshall the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If it is refused, it is no pardon. George Wilson must be hanged. 2,000 years ago, God the Son, Jesus Christ, he issued a pardon. But just like in the case of George Wilson, the value of the pardon is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If it is refused, there is no pardon. Friends, we don't have to accept God's love and God's sacrifice for us. We can refuse. But the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. God he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And the good news today is God has pardoned you. God has pardoned me. God has pardoned us. But we have to accept this pardon. And God's kind of love is unselfish, which results in doing the best for another, even at the highest personal cost. 
without expecting or requiring payback. For by grace are we saved through faith and not of ourselves. It is a gift from God. For God so loved the world. Friends, God loves you no matter what. God died for you. And God wants you to be a part of his kingdom. There's nothing we can do more to make God love us more. But there's also nothing we can do to make God love us any less. Adultery, God doesn't love you any less. Divorce, God doesn't love you any less. Drugs, God doesn't love you any less. Deceit, God doesn't love you any less. Lying, God doesn't love you any less. In fact, he loved you when you were unlovable. He loved you when you didn't love him. He loved you when you didn't want to go to church. He loved you when you didn't want to pray. He loved you when you were maybe strung out. He loved you maybe when you were shooting up. He loved you when you didn't love yourself. He loved you when you didn't want to be loved. He didn't wait for you to get right and then start loving you. But he loved you when you didn't do right. He loved you when you weren't acting right. He loved you when you weren't living right. Greater love hath no man than this who would lay down his life for a friend. Let me close this way. The story is told of a grandfather who found his grandson jumping up and down in his crib and playpen, crying at the top of his lungs. When the little boy, little Johnny, when he saw his grandfather, he reached up with his little hands and his chubby little cheeks, and he said, out, Grandpa, out. Out! Grandfather looked down at his little grandson, and it was only natural for the grandfather to want to lift his little grandson out of his little predicament. But just as the grandfather was reaching down to lift his little grandson up out of the playpen, out of the crib, the little boy's mother came up and she said, No, Johnny. You're being punished. You must stay in. The grandfather was torn. He was betwixt and between. He was at a loss as to what to do. Because his grandson's tears, his chubby little cheeks, his hands reached deep into his grandfather's heart. But yet the mother's firmness in correcting her son for his misbehaving couldn't be taken lightly. Here was a problem of love versus law. But love found a way. The grandfather couldn't take the youngster out of the playpen. So what did he do? He crawled in the playpen with him. God, my friends, did not spare Paul and Silas the suffering and imprisonment of that Philippian jail. But he came down to be in the prison with them. God did not keep the three Hebrew boys out of the fiery furnace, but he went into the fiery furnace with them. God didn't release us from the pain, the predicaments, the perplexities and problems of this world but he came down himself into this world because he loved us and he died to save us. John 1.1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then verse 14 continues and says, And the Word became flesh. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I've said all of this to say simply this, and that's our assignment. 
the best assignment to love God and to love one another. Father, teach us how to love. Teach us how to love you and teach us how to love one another. That's our best assignment in Jesus' name. And friends of mine, that's your best assignment in order to live your best life yet. Love God and love one another. The Bible is clear in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loveth knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Carry out your assignment. Love God and love others. That's your best life. Because when you do that, you will inherit eternal life with God and with others forever and ever. Now, I don't know about you, but that's what I'm looking forward to spending the rest of my life with Jesus and those who love him. Let's pray. Our Father, teach us and show us how to love. How to love you and how to love one another. That's our best assignment so that we can live our best life. So we can live with you forever and ever and ever. Thank you for your love. And we promise you, Lord, we're going to love you back. It's in Jesus' name we pray. God bless you, and may God keep you, and live your best life, recognizing your best assignment.